Hello again, everybody. Dan John here from danjohnuniversity.com. Welcome to episode 124 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Got lots of things to share with you before we get started with the questions today. First off, uh, you know, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's, um, all the other various celebrations that we're going through with all of our day different faith traditions. It's a, a lovely time. Uh, I've been shoveling a lot of snow recently, which is, I guess, great workouts because I'm always sore and tired after. Uh, over at the university, we have our, our code, all capital letters, new year, one word, new year, one word. That'll get you uh, our site at, uh, you know, uh, about a, a third uh, discount for uh, three months. And uh, I think it's a great deal. Uh uh, the number one thing we try to provide at the site is service, and uh, we have been, that, that's what it's all about. We're trying to help people train at home, uh, help personal trainers come up with intelligent programming, and just have a great community that people like to be part of. Uh, speaking of, somebody at our forum asked a good question. His name's Alex, and he said, Dan, do you want to talk about some of your game changers? So, you know, I start on it, and then I realized that. Well, there's so many in my career. Now, I always go through this order, something like this. I'll, I'll say um, Olympic lifting, then I'll go loaded carries, and I'll say easy strength, and then I'll say, well, and original strength, and then I'll say, well, and slosh pipes, and then uh, hill sprints, and then... So Brian had a good idea uh, to put together a series of courses. So as I'm speaking, the first course with 11 chapters and an appendix. By the way, that my first attempt at Game Changers, we made the appendix. And we have 11 different, uh, what I consider Game Changers in my career. Now, a few of them, if you know my work, you'll be like, okay, I'm going to talk about the Sears Weightlifting Bar, 1965. I'm going to talk about the Dave Davis article, 1974. I'm talking Dick Knottmeyer, 1975. Okay, original strength, easy strength. But I'm also going to talk about a few things I don't really... T tell people enough about that made my life easier as both a coach and as an athlete. So those will all be in this course. This is part one. Uh, we already have enough information for a part two coming up later, a couple months from now. And then by the time we get there, there'll be no question. There'll be three parts because this is a topic. You know, uh, one of the first questions we're going to have today, the person asked me about, you know, what are some things I thought were good or bad when I first heard them? Well, I've been lifting weights since 1965. I've been coaching since 1979. I mean, I, I literally just finished an Olympic lifting front squat and bodybuilding workout followed by a nice long walk. I just ate a, a bowl of vegetable soup with kimchi and then my magic oatmeal with all the seeds in it. Folks, these are a lot of things. I don't know if I'd have done those, you know, 40, 50 years ago. They weren't even inside my head. Um, doing kettlebells uh, was unheard of. So I was kind of lucky. I've been around long enough. So to me, it's more than just curls, you know, sit-ups. And uh, of course, even jogging wasn't around when I first started to lift. So it's been a while. So I'm going to try to share with a lot of these ideas with you. Uh, it'll be available at the site when you hear today's podcast. DanJohnUniversity.com. Sign up with New Year, one word. Get the courses. I think you'll be happy. Uh, the We have, uh, for it's free for members. We have a couple of uh, member uh, courses that are free. Uh, easy Strength for Fat Loss. Uh, there's a lifetime view. A couple of them do cost. The Easy Strength ones, uh, the other, the more major focused Easy Strength workshops, the one on the basics of Easy Strength and, of course, advanced techniques, we do charge for. But I think you'll like them. All right, well, enough selling. Let's let's get to the questions. We have a question from Phil. I had a brother named Phil, and I loved him. You've seen so many things come and go in the world of strength and condition. <laughs> it's funny, Phil. I, I, I can't thank you for that segue enough, and I, I don't know how that happened. What are the things that you were initially skeptical, skeptical of that won you over? Let's start with that, and then the next one is, and those that appeared to have great value at first but turned out to be a bust. All right, no, no. We're going to do the second one first, okay, Phil? Anytime the word Bulgarian, Russian, or Soviet was thrust onto a, a workout or an idea, 
uh, I now sit back and I call BS. Uh, I'm, I had a good buddy here. He, he's moved to Denver now, Vasily. And one day we were talking about the Soviet methods and he's a Soviet, you know, he was a Soviet weightlifter. He was a Soviet Olympic lifter. And he, he didn't say BS, he, he filled those letters out. And he said that the nonsense we were reading was nonsense. And then after that, I got this little skeptical eye and I started calling and talking to people that were quoted in these Soviet uh, articles. And almost universally, it said, I never did that. That's not true. Um, after the fall, and just before the fall of the Iron Curtain, whatever we call it, the Berlin Wall, uh, a whole bunch of people from the Eastern Europe started coming over here. And I'm, I'm the worst. I believe all the nonsense they said. One of the guys turned out to be basically a, a youth uh, swim coach. And he still, uh, people still go, oh, you know, he said things that Yuri Sadiq did in his training. Yuri is doing these exercises. Well, I had, you know, I used to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with Yuri, the late Yuri Sadiq, world record holder in the hammer. And I would ask him, did you really do this? And the one time I asked him about the thing about doing the step-ups, he got so angry. It was funny because, you know, usually he was pretty, you know, it was a Soviet, so pretty stoic, you know, you know, pretty, you know, he got excited about jazz music, and I think that's about it. And he just said, ah, this is, it was BS. Again, he didn't use the letters. He spelled the whole word out. And he goes, that person doesn't know me. He never talked to me. He never talked to Bondarchuk. He doesn't know what he's saying. And it was interesting because he got so animated because of this BS that they came up with. Uh, I went down word by word by word of what this person first did in the first workshops this person gave. And I followed up as best I could. And everything was, was BS. There was another guy who showed up and uh, he was a, he did a workshop here in Utah. And when we left, a group of us all got together and go, this guy is a lunatic. Uh, uh, he certainly did like his growth hormone, I'll tell you that. But uh, other than that, it's all BS. Vasily did add um, a couple of things that I think were important. One thing he said clearly was, uh, uh, and by the way, when you talk to a Soviet, it is like talking to somebody from Barcelona. Barcelona, Barcelona, is they do, um, when they get animated, they they do start to uh, uh, turn those T-S's into the th sound. T-H's, pardon me, and the S's into a th sound. And he goes, well, you know, if, you, if you're going to talk about the Soviet or Bulgarian system, you have to talk about drugs first. And I said, okay, uh, PEDs, anabolics, injections, massive amounts. He said, don't forget, the athletes were paid. Uh, their job was to throw. And I remember one time uh, I was talking to another Soviet. I won't give you names, but basically uh, his his job was to sleep uh, nine to 12 hours a day and have two training sessions, uh, you know, j shovel all the food he could down in the cafeteria and then take all the pills his coach gave him. Um, if you live in a situation where you have a cafeteria your coach gives you lot, lots of drugs to swallow down as an athlete. And you're paid, well, good for you. And Vasily made a good point. He said, these could be life and death choices for your family. Um, especially when things were rough, being an athlete, uh, a successful athlete, bumped you up. Uh, here in the United States, of course, we have the same. Ideally, it's a little better now, but there was a long time with it. If you were a a coal mine, a child of a coal miner, um, you could either work in the coal mines the rest of your life or become a really good football player. Um, certainly certain inner city kids, they saw certain sports as the ticket out. Hey, hi, I'm Dan John. And I watched my brothers go to Vietnam and get, uh, you know, severely disabled, badly injured by, you know, by combat. And I'm sitting around at the kitchen table going, yeah, I better throw that discus a little bit farther. The reason I trained so hard in the weight room and threw the discus so much is I wasn't real interested in, in getting blown up in one of America's wars. Um, so, okay, let's move on. Um, another conversation is kind of funny with a, a, a buddy of ours uh, not long ago. We're sitting around and he was really talking about this amazing thing about the Soviet system. And I said, it's all BS. And he said, well, no, no, no. And I go, okay, summarize the Soviet system. And he said, well, they had variation. And I thought to myself, who 
doesn't have variation. I live in Utah. We have a fall that's a fall. There's snow there now. Six months from now, it's going to be, a, you know, it's going to be so hot. We, ha we can't leave barbells and kettlebells outside because you'll literally burn your hands off. That's variation. Um, it, you know, when I was an athlete, I played American football. I wrestled. I did uh, track and field. I did soccer and I did basketball. There's variation. Uh, I just uh, saved you guys a lot of money. There you go. There's variation in a nutshell. Okay. Having said that, don't forget at the time, if you opened up American, uh, American Journal, uh, Athletic Journal, or Scholastic Coach, Arthur Jones had bought, you know, 16, 17 pages of advertising, and it was telling everybody one set to failure is all an athlete needs. <clears throat> uh, and I, of course, I now think that training to failure is training to fail. Ooh, that's a pretty good quote. So here we are in the 80s where all of our athletes are wearing uh, neon colored polyester clothes with headbands, you know, going for the burn with the Jane Fonda VHS recording, you know, doing those, uh, you know, those little, what did she call those? Fire hydrants, you know, the fire hydrants and the, uh, the bird dogs and fire hydrants going for the burn because, you know, if you get the burn, you'll be a better athlete. So all of our athletes are going for the burn. And these, uh, you know, East European athletes are lifting heavy weights and doing their sport. That's on us, folks. That's on us. Um, you know, when 1975, Arnold shows up with the, the book Education of a Bodybuilder and uh, Pumping Iron. And then, of course, Conan. Conan's bigger than people think. That movie was bigger than people think. You got Jane Fonda and the, and the East Germans and the uh, the the... the, the the Soviets are just training like I tell people now. Uh, we had a sprint coach come from uh, uh, Eastern Bloc. And everything this sprint coach said at this clinic I went to would have been the exact same thing Bud Winter said in 1968, the San Jose State uh, sprint coach. To the point that, in hindsight, I just think the person just copied and pasted Bud Winters and pretended it had some, some other fancy thing. Okay, now let's answer the first question. Things. Oh, okay. So, uh, what I might have missed, Phil, in this whole rant, is I believed all of it. I mean, I subscribed to the magazines, I read the books, all these books that uh, there's a kettlebell organization that just falls in love with this stuff, and uh, I, there's always there's always an asterisk on all that stuff to me. I believed it. I bought the. Bulgarian boost protocol, the one where you fast 14 hours and then you take these tiny little bits of amino acids and you train like a, a, a psychopath for a couple hours and then you ate. I, I did it all. I did everything stupid and none of it worked, folks. None of it worked. Things I do regret. Oh, in fact, why am I even talking? What? Take my new course over at Dan John University, uh, Game Changers. Let me just give you a Four. I'll give you four. Number one, I never appreciated hill sprints enough. Um, I have replaced my my old two weeks, two times a week hill sprinting. I now do back pedaling. I have those titanium hips, so I have to be a little careful about the thud. And the other thing is, I don't really live close. There is a hill right over in Wheeler Farm, just across the way there, which I use in the summer. But this time of year, it's way too muddy, way too wet, way too slick. So I do uh, hill sprints on the plowed streets, um, backward sprints on, on the streets here. The other thing I'm, I didn't appreciate enough were chains, but it wasn't until Bigger, Faster, Stronger made the chains with the collar. So uh, people were just throwing the chains over, hanging with rope. Bigger, Faster, uh, Stronger made a collar with the screw down with a big heavy chain underneath it. I talked about it in a, just one of my little Instagram accounts the other day. Of course, uh, the next thing, the, so the third thing would be, of course, easy strength. Easy strength is how we trained in the 1960s. And then I, I ignored it. And then I started doing it in 2003, 2004, and rediscovered what I learned in 1965, which just frustrates me more than anything else. And I guess there is a fourth one. I never appreciated recovery as much as I should. Um, hold on just a second. So... I went to Costco the other day. Costco is a little, you know, those those warehouse stores. And uh, there was one of these. This is this uh, 
I don't know, it's one of these little uh, pulsating things, you know, you press the button and then you, uh, uh, you put it right where you, I, I did push-ups last week and I'm still sore. And I am, I've kind of a come up with a training idea where I do this uh, when I do my uh, Hooper bar, which is that, that light bar that I do um, three squat snatches every 35 seconds for 30 rounds. And between, after the squat snatches, I, I do these on my hot spots. I do them downstairs because it's so cold. And that's how I warm up now. Uh, I'm taking the sauna a lot more seriously now. Um, I'm taking meditation a lot more seriously. I think meditation is part of recovery. So yeah, so Phil, I know that was a, a longish rant and I kind of went on for a while. But yeah, I, so first off, there's nothing new in elite sports really hugely new since people started lifting weights uh dave davis you know do your power lifts and olympic lifts i would add loaded carries so um do the basics of the power lifts do basic olympic lifts and do loaded carries um do those three days a week work real hard um recover uh i like heat more than i like cold and the research tells us that you get the same out of both I don't have to worry about cold. I, <laughs> I work in my garage here in Utah. Uh, I think you need more, a lot of vegetables. I think you need protein. I think you need water. Those are the three things my mom told me, and she was right, and it's still true. Nothing's news under the sun. Uh, I hope that helped. I know I went for a while, but I like that question, I think. So thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. We got a question from Alberto, and Alberto says... When it comes to programming sets and reps, I always guide myself by your numbers. That shows great wisdom. Listening to me is always a good idea. In fact, I should do that more often myself. Uh, he says, this is 15 to 30 reps for the push, pull, and squat family. So when I say 15 to 30 reps, those come from Thomas DeLorme. And basically that's three sets of eight, five sets of five, you know, you know the numbers, three sets of five, five sets of three, they all fit, three sets of 10. The rule of 10 for strength, and that would, for him, it's the Turkish getup and heavy, heavy implement power exercises such as cleans. So that's three sets of three, five sets of two, you know, that kind of thing. 75 to 125 reps for the swings. Yeah, five sets of 15 is a great, great workout. My question is if you have a reference number of reps for the pattern exercises, yeah, you... I do. In fact, you really should read uh, or listen to any of my workshops on programming. I have a programming course on the site, danjohnuniversity.com, Alberto. And I go through this, but I'll give you the basics. When it comes to patterning, uh, I like to use time. So the push-up position plank, two minutes. Um, heck, with the hip, the, the glute bridge, I like a minute. Uh, I have a number of different tests in the goblet squat. Uh, if you read my book, Heart Style Kettlebell Challenge, I have a six-minute squat test, which is really just you sit in the bottom position and you stand up every 30 seconds. But you, the question, uh, push-ups don't, um, push-ups, whatever you do for push-ups, I, I think push-ups make you way too sore for what you get out of them. Um, and if you're too good at push-ups, they just, they just start to rip up your shoulders. Um, I do like doing, I do, I do do this one thing on push-ups where I superset them with uh, military press. So I do a set of five military rest, do a set of five push-ups rest. And I like that a lot. Alberto, but when it comes to the, the, the suspension trainer work, the T's, the Y's, the I's, one of the things Mike Warren Brown is having me do is a lot more. Um, I don't know. I love suspension trainer work. I, I love it. I think I think it's one of the 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 one arm the one arm suspension trainer row where you hold it for a moment with your thumb inside your arm. But I, I think that is a game changer. I like my heels together, my knees together, and the other arm straight like this, so you can see if you're you know, you're twisting away or something. We're starting to do them, you know. Um, we do the T, the Y, the I, the two handed row a curl, a tricep extension, and then a mobility movement. And we'll do rounds of that in our warm-up. Um, the bulk of the people who train with me in my facility are males, and they're North American males. 
Therefore, we all have bad shoulders. It is just kind of a given. I think hanging makes a difference. And I'm also discovering too, Alberto, this is just extra, but when I hang and then I do those knee ups, those uh, hanging bent knee leg raises, uh, not only do I think that's great for my ab wall and my lower back flexibility, if you do it uh, lower, when you do that hanging knee, you, you, you have to, so if this is my belt, when you do the hanging knee thing, you go like this, and I think it's good for your lower back because it felt, feels very tonic. Of course, anytime you're working the ab wall, but the hanging and that movement together at the same time seem great for the shoulders. So my point is for the exercises you asked, either do them for time, like a minute or so, so or just do a lot of them. And I don't think you can overdo, I, you can overdo everything. I mean, you, I mean, if you're a total idiot, Alberto, don't. But if you're a normal person, you know, uh, you, you can do a lot of TYIs, a lot of two-handed rows on suspension trainer. And you can use it as a warm-up, but you can also use it to, to really bring those bring that whole backside uh, back into that nice groove. Since I started hanging and since I started doing more of these warm-up TYI row stuff with Mike, uh, it's going to sound strange, but I actually sleep better because um, if you've ever had a bad shoulder you and you fall asleep on one side, you do wake up in pain and have to deal, deal with it a little bit. I hope that helps. I hope I answered the question. Don't forget those other resources, <clears throat> danjohnuniversity.com, the programming, and just go on here on the YouTube and maybe look at some of the workshops I've done on the movement matrix where I explain this stuff in more detail. Thank you. Um, got a question from Ben and I like this question, Ben. I don't often hear feedback about twice per week training on the podcast. Yeah, I, back in 1991, 92, I had a great series of conversations and training sessions and throwing session with the late Swedish discus thrower, Jorn Svensson. Now, God bless Jorn. I didn't know that he had all kinds of other issues. Uh, let's, and, and he, he did. He did have a, 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 a tragic young death. But uh, one of the things I liked about Yorn, and I, my, that journal is in, is in that uh, library back there, is our conversations. He had these great ideas about lifting just twice a week as an elite thrower. When you first hear that, you know, you're always hearing, oh, you're training three days a week. Well, I'm going to train four. You're training four. I'm going to train five. You're training twice a day. I'm going to train four times a day. You're eating uh, 100 grams of protein. I'm going to eat 5,000 grams of protein a day. Uh, it, we, we're just crazy. And he's the first person who ever went to me and said, no, let's just do two days. And nicely, you have it here for us. Uh, so I'd offer some rambling thoughts about my experience with the program template. Okay, enjoy. Well, thank you, man. I really like the loose feel of twice a week training especially with my busy medical school schedule. Hey, you know, Ben, it's nice to know you're in medical school because I get questions all the time that people want medical advice from me. And uh, this will shock you, but uh, I've never uh, actually gone to medical school. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, the only surgeries I know are with my uh, very nice letter opener, okay? Um, the program you received from Joran Svensson has been great for me. Day one, power clean bench press. Day two, snatch front squat. Boy, that is still. I mean, I look at that now and I'm like, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Day one, power clean bench press. Day two, snatch front squat. After trying this away a few months, uh, I made my I made it my own with three alterations. Switch bench press to overhead press. Now, I would agree with that. Switch front squat to overhead squat. Um in my person, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with you. In my case, I would probably flow overhead squat for a few weeks, front squat for a few weeks. That would just be my, because that's what I did. And then thankfully, Ben saw the weakness in there, added a different loaded carry, bear hug, waiter walk to the end of each session. Ben, if I was to work with an elite athlete right now, I would hire you as my strength coach. Uh, I love what you've done there. Um, it's interesting to think I was getting this. I, I had never even heard of Jim Wendler. Uh, and yet the, you'll notice that uh, Joran's uh, ideas are very similar to Wendler's. 
One thing though about Yorn, I don't know if you're getting uh, one of the things he was really big in, and, and it's some he he wanted me to do eights sets of eight, which was really strange. But if you read my work, you can see the influence of it because Yorn's program became the transformation uh, transformation program, and basically the roots of one lift a day. So we would do a set of eight in the front squat, and th then do a, a right after rack the bar step back and do a plyometric drill of some kind. Uh, he had, uh, I liked always trying to jump and touch the ceiling, uh, try to touch it with my right hand, the first set, left hand second. He, he had a, he had a really interesting one where he, he, he did high leaps, but landed in, uh, what we would call the lunge position. Don't get all excited. We weren't doing lunges. So lunge, 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 lunge like that for height, but we weren't lunging. He was just because he felt that was a throwing thing. Um, and um, after the, so the nice thing is after overhead press, you could probably instantly go and do some medicine ball throws or something like that. Whereas in the bench press, you'd have to get up and do something. I also walk for up to an hour a day as part of my commute and try to do some weighted pull up several times a week. Right now I can do six sets of three with 40 pounds. Hey, Ben, you know what you should do is write that into an article or um, <laughs> start your own forum in that workout. I, I hate to say it's a perfect workout because there's no such thing, but that is pretty good. So let's review, folks. Day one, power clean, overhead press. Day two, snatch and overhead squat. Now, we used to call that exercise the exercise. Uh, and then do a loaded carry, an hour of walking a day, and several pull-ups. That's, uh, that's the highest price I can give. It's very good. Thanks for sharing that with us, Ben. And... Uh, I got to tell you, this might be the best set of questions ever. Let's see if it continues. Will says, I'm a 35-year-old strongman competitor. Over the years, I've been I've had elbow tendonitis at different points that I know is mostly, most potently while doing pull-ups. I once heard someone say that elbow issues can be downstream from too much grip intensive work. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. Uh, I've been told about the elbow is that if you have an elbow problem, look at the wrist and look at the shoulder. And sometimes that will uh, tell you the real issue. Uh, I also know that if you fail on pull-ups enough, you'll get what we call MAPS, middle age pull-up syndrome. Uh, what do you think about utilizing straps on pulling uh, or back focus movements as a means of easing up on grip and therefore avoiding MAPS, middle age pull-up syndrome? Uh, the Yeah, it, it's weird. I, if you'd have told me that years ago, I'd have thought, yeah, that probably would help. Now, actually, I would say the opposite helps. So there's these things you can get. They're these little foam things like this. They're, they look like a, they're foam, and it looks like a letter C. They have a line here. They're called like thick grips or fat grips or something. Oddly, I think those help with shoulders more because you have to do the pull-up with your grip like this. So you slap them on, and you, you have that big C grip Weirdly, that seems to help some people who've had MAPS not get it before because it really does cut back the number of reps you have. You know, I like what you're saying, and if it works for you, by God, keep doing it. But um, I, I tell you, what hurts is the fail. It seems to me uh, failing on pull-ups is the worst thing you can do for your elbow. I mean, it, it just, it always seems to be the thing. Um, if you can do 20 pull-ups, you know, do lots and lots of sets in the 5 to 13, 14, 15 range and just, or add load and never fail. Never fail in pull-ups. Easy, easy to say. And of course, if you're like me, nearly impossible to do. All right. Thank you. I hope that helped. Well, question from Shelva. What's your opinion? My opinion about load and intensity variations, which is, which if more useful for strength, which is more useful for strength development? Well, uh, he's a, okay. So the question is for strength development, what's better load and intensity variations. But see the problem I'm having Shalva is I don't know if there's any difference between load and intensity the way I train. Um, so I, I've never believed in those idiotic, uh, charts you know the tables that are just bs you know what is the one you're supposed to be able to do 90 percent of your best for like two to five 
yeah, if you're if you're not very strong, maybe. <laughs> um, Dave Tate, who I think is a genius, once said, if he sees a program have 90% within the first six months, he throws it away. Because at him, you know, like he was telling me, he, he had 13 different people bench press at the same time, 800 pounds. 13 people benching 800. Well, 90% of 800 is 720. And if even if you're a kilo person, I don't care. That's a lot of weight. Um, is it good to train the same lift in different volume and intensity ranges? Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that is what we do. That's yeah. I mean, I mean, I train my, uh, Olympic snatch in every possible range I can think about. And that is of course load. Um, but I just, from, so I guess if you're going to ask me if it's Olympic lifts, it's load and maybe the everything else, it would be what you, most people call intensity. But as you know, I mean, I've, if you take my, programming course at danjohnuniversity.com the hardest thing to understand in our field is what do you, what do you mean by intensity because i don't think it's a percent nor do i think it's going to failure i think intensity is you know what is called for at the moment uh, i watch these videos on the netflix of the weightlifters and they're always losing their crap they're always screaming at each other and slapping at each other and tossing chalk on each other in practice sessions. Well, practice, I'm talking about practice. I don't, I don't agree with that. For example, heavy, medium, light days with the same reps, different reps with different intensities, different percents, uh, or however we can manipulate those two variables. Is it better than linear approach? Well, of course it's better than linear approach. Linear approach works for brand new people learning something the first time. Um, uh, very, very, very few people can do linear progression correctly. The only person I know is Marty Gallagher. And uh, that's why I have great respect for Marty. But even his linear progression has some interesting intensity variations built in. But it has to be built in. So I, I guess really, um, besides going to my brilliant programming uh, uh, thing on Dan John University, you might want to look into some of Marty Gallagher's work. <clears throat> my favorite of his books is... Um, Purposeful, primitive. And somebody told me there's a new edition of it coming out. <clears throat> Pardon me. And if there is, it looks like I have to spend some more money because I'll pick it up in a minute. I, I hope that helped. Uh, that's, a, that's a broad question. Well, we have a very long question from Emily. Um, I'm not sure if I should cut it back or not, but let me start going. Now, there's some things about this question that if you've been listening for a while, you know, bother me. I don't, I, there's a certain kind of question I don't like to answer. And usually it's que questions about people's children. Uh, and the reason I don't like to answer it is because uh, I don't like, I mean, if the kid doesn't, if the kid doesn't, I mean, I mean, there's this person I know has been bragging about their 12 year old being an elite athlete. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> Maybe in gymnastics you could say that, but no other sport can you really discern. Well, I guess maybe there's some others, but none of the sports I, I utilize. But let's get started. I'm writing for fitness and parenting advice. Well, fitness I can help you with. Parenting I'll do my best. My daughter started high school this year. In middle school, in middle school she ran cross country and track. A few seasons were disrupted by the pandemic, sure. And wants to do the same in high school. Good. It, those cross country and track are wonderful. While she enjoys the sport, she is consistently the slowest runner on the teams, last in nearly every race. She says that she's not competitive, but also at times gets upset with her results. Well, that's a, already a combination of, well, okay. The thing is both her dad and I think that her results are the product of what she's putting into the sports. Boy, you know what, Emily? I, I think I like you already. That's nice because I agree. You know, uh, that's the beautiful thing about cross country, track and field, and swimming is you get what you put in, not what your coach does, which I love. She never looks like she's really pushing herself. And at the end of the race, she generally crossed the finish line and then walk off. She'll talk about how she pushed herself, but she's clearly not as visibly worn out as the other athletes. No huffing and puffing, etc. She attends and participates in every practice during the season, but she doesn't run consistently in the off season. Uh, you know, you gotta you gotta hear what I'm hearing. Then, um, 
I get this ice as a football coach. There were guys who just wanted to have the uniform on. There's a great uh, uh, California football team, uh, high school football team, that only allows 35 people to suit for varsity games. And they have a winning streak that is just stunning. But when I talked to the coach about it, he said that the athletes will, you know, if you find out you're the 38th, 39th athlete on the team, they just do all these extra works. They take up, you know, like the one, he told me one kid found out there was only one deep snapper on the team. So he trained himself as a deep snapper to get into the top 35, just so he could, just so he could wear, just to be on the sidelines at games. Um, maybe your daughter just wants to be on the team. Um, she doesn't sound so far like, uh, uh, you know, this, it, I'm not talking cardiovascular. I'm talking about courage and heart. That's a tough one. Uh, I don't have, um, okay, uh, she she will make plans to run every day, which I think is not necessarily good in the off season. Meh, it better not, you know, and then stop entirely after just a few days. Well, yeah, yeah I don't, I don't, I just don't know if her heart's in it. Uh, maybe she, I don't know. My question is, should we be making her, her either train more in the off season or quit? I don't know if you want her to quit, but I hate to pressure her about this because I'm happy overall that she is doing something physical at least part of the year. I don't have a background in team sports that gives me experience to draw from to figure out what to do here. Part of me thinks, well, somebody has to come in last, so <laughs> just let it go. But I admit that as a mother, it hurts my heart to see it consistently be my kid. Yeah, I don't know how you put up with it. I don't, of course, I come from a different world kind of family, which I don't recommend to anybody else. Uh, my husband, for what it's worth, has always been athletically gifted, picking up sports quickly, and then excelling at them when he puts forth some effort. His mind is boggled, as mine is, that a person would participate in a sport if they had no chance of winning. He throws up his hands and says, I have no idea when I ask him if, if he thinks we should be pushing her more. Do you have any parenting or coaching advice? Yeah, parenting advice, yeah. Uh, no TV on school nights. Um, have a list of chores and you expect her to do every day. Uh, have a menu for breakfast and dinner. Um, uh, make sure she reads 15 minutes a day. There's your there's your parenting advice. Um <laughs> Coaching advice in this situation is a tough one. I mean, uh, one of my favorite athletes I've ever worked with, Lacey, um, you know, she was, and I mean, she thinks, uh, she says she was terrible her first year, but she trained really, really hard the entire year and came back and became my best 1500 meter runner in one year. But it was all because of her. Um, that's the thing about track and field. And it's something you might want to talk about with your daughter. And I would, personally, I would do this. I think it's wonderful that your daughter's on the cross country and track team. I think it's great. If she's okay with coming in last and she just wants to be there for the jersey and be there for the camaraderie, that's great. Um, be sure, though, you say to her, it, you know, it'd be nice. It's nice that you're part of it. Do you, And very simply, if you want to excel, that's on you. We're fine with where you're at now. Emily, I don't have any more advice than that. I'm sorry. This is a, I, I already feel like I've said too much. Um, but thank you for sharing. Uh, yeah, my family was a little different. We were, it's not fun to play cards with my family because we're so competitive. It's not fun to play board games and I don't like it. So even if I, the other day we were playing a game. It's called golf. It's a card game. And I purposely did some things to get, uh, to just kind of, I wouldn't say, you know, get high scores to lose basically. And the next time we played, uh, I got taunted for it because I played so badly. And I thought, that's my family. And I'm not sure this is good or bad, but this is who we are. Gosh, I hope that helps. And I hope none of my family listens to this. Thank you. We got a question from Neil. Dan, recently watched your If All You Have Is One Kettlebell video. Yeah, it's on uh, YouTube and uh, Instagram. And I was wondering what you would recommend for someone who had extreme, who was extremely underbelled, say a 25-pound bell. 
Uh, there is an older style of training, and there's some real value in it. Uh, you see it showing up sometimes where you get the reps up into the 20, 25 range, and you stay there for a while. One thing you probably have to do, uh, Neil, is <laughs> you'll have to kneel, uh, for example, on your presses, uh, half kneeling presses, um, maybe single arm rows, um, 25 pound kettle, uh, kettlebell, instead of swinging, you'd want to snatch, uh, get the reps up, you know, do sets of 100. Um, goblet squats, 25 is fine. And maybe Turkish get-ups. So on the press and row, think like two sets of 25, two sets of 20, big numbers, which are kind of actually, I've done that. It's, uh, I did a program uh, written by Terry and Jan Todd years ago where I was doing two sets of 25 or two sets of 20. And I got to tell you, for just three weeks, I really enjoyed it. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it's something I couldn't do the rest of my life, but I liked it for the few weeks. I did that. I did that. That was month one. Month two was like 12 to 15 reps. And month three was five to eight reps. And I, I liked it. Um, actually, I did that for quite a while before I, I, I slid back into Olympic lifting. So yeah. So think uh, half kneeling press, two sets of 20, 25, whatever they are. Uh, really... Uh, Lock that row down so there's so you know. Um, I would suggest maybe putting your left hand on a chair or bench, putting your left knee on a chair or a bench, and then holding the hinge as tight as you can. Uh, bring that bell into the thumb into the armpit on each and every rep. Pause two, three, you know, at that weight. Uh, goblet squat, go ahead and do yeah, 20, 25. That'd be interesting. And then maybe a set of a hundred or, you know, just kind of randomly have a series of numbers, a 50, a 70, a 50 and 80, a hundred, a 200, something like that. And just, you know, maybe just get a pair of dice or something like that and just r randomly roll. And then some Turkish get-ups. I don't think that's terrible. It's not, it's not perfect, but it's, it's not bad. I hope that helped. Thank you. Jim says, I would like to hear your thoughts on the kettlebell mile suitcase carry with a 24 K. I know you are a proponent of loaded carries, but what about extended distance and loading for those distances? Well, Jim, I mean, there's nothing wrong with going for a, a we do occasionally we do the cook drill. That's where you carry a 24 kilo bell and you hold it waiter, walk, rack, walk, suitcase carry, and you just go back and forth the whole time. Uh, some of my, uh, top end uh, special forces guys I worked with that one one of them two of them went out for a 10k one time with the 32 and when one would get tired they hand it to the other guy and I got the highest praise one could get uh, from somebody in their particular group that was hard which was high high praise from these guys yeah I, I don't mind the idea of a suitcase carry for um, you know, switching hands um I don't know how many times you really need to do it, but I, I think I think for long term you're you're gonna have some seriously healthy lower back yeah, and spine. Yeah, I, I think that's great. Big I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan of that stuff because I get bored as hell doing that kind of stuff, but I can certainly see the value of it. Okay, thanks. We got a question from Austin. Austin says this I'm a 28-year-old man who has been training since I was 17. Despite this long time, I have I've had pretty mediocre results. Uh, Austin, that's that's the norm. Most people have crappy results. Yeah, because they go from thing to thing to thing to thing. The reason is very clear, paralysis by analysis. And, of course, that would be the other reason. I've started programs over and over and was never, never able to get through them, simply because I always felt like something was left out and could not stop critiquing people with decades of experience. Well, yeah, yeah. I, what's the word for that? Uh, um, uh stupid uh but hey you've come around and to be honest with you 17 to 27 year old males um probably are as arrogant and dangerous as anybody in our society so yeah um you can probably guess i never finished a single program Woo! and i want to change that yeah austin you do so instead of doing one thing austin you're gonna do three let's do this 
at the start of next year, I, I want to do what I think of as the Dan John trifecta. Oh, this is great. What are your thoughts on doing the 10K swing challenge followed by Mass Made Simple and Easy Strength? Each program one after another with only a short week or two break in between. Uh, actually, the 10K swing challenge, a week off in Mass Made Simple would work well. I always recommend to people before uh, Mass Made Simple to uh, lean out. And many people lean out on the 10K. Um, I like the order a lot. Uh, the nice thing is, is that the 10K swing challenge, uh, if you can't finish that, there's no way you're going to finish Mass Made Simple, man. Mass Made Simple is tough. I mean, it's, it, it's as hard as a velocity diet in some ways. I mean, it's tough. But once you get done with the Mass Made Simple and you move to easy strength, it'll be fun to watch what your numbers do uh, when you go from those two big volume workouts, the big volume of swings, the big volume of squats, into something very simple. I like it. In fact, you know, I'm kind of amazed at how much I like it, Austin. I, I think that's great. Uh, let's see. We're looking at um, four, five, six, twelve. We're looking at about, you know, anywhere from probably at the tightest would be 18 weeks and the longest, just spitballing here, about 23, 24 weeks. That's going to get you almost half a year. Yeah, I like it. Uh, uh, when you get to easy strength, uh, might be a good time to look at a nutritional intervention of some kind. I'm not saying necessarily diet, but, you know, maybe uh, some kind of tweak on your, uh, you know, on your caloric load, just just to lean out a little bit, but yeah, I like this. I like it a lot. So yeah, go. You got, you got my, the Dan John thumbs up, but wait, wait, there's more. Two thumbs up. Nicely done, Austin. Hey, well, there you go. There's our questions for this week. Um, episode 124 is now behind us. Uh, reminder, if you have questions and I'm always happy to answer them, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and I'll do my best to answer each and every one. If you're still listening, which if you are a braver man than I, Gunga Din, um, don't forget we have the new course over at uh, Dan John University and remember that new year, one word uh, for the code to get it cheaper, uh, to get the, the website cheaper, okay? Dan John University. Hope that helps. And until next time, Let's keep on lifting and learning, okay?